Hello Hotbits and welcome back to another video here at the Goblin Nest. And in this video, we're going to learn how to play the Lord of the Rings, or sorry, Middle Earth strategy battle game by Games Workshop. This is going to be a full tutorial showing the basic rules. We're not going to be worrying about all the special rules. We're just going to have a basic game with a few um, units. We're not going to worry about army composition or war gear options or difficult terrain or any other special rules. We're just going to learn the basic rules, the basic rule system, so that you can start playing this game. So, let's get to it. Now, in order to play The Lord of the Rings, there's a few things you need. And if you are a brand new player, I would just quickly like to recommend the Lord of the Rings Battle of Pelennor Fields box set by Games Workshop. This is an absolutely amazing set which will give you everything you need and more in order to play the game. A game of um, Middle Earth is usually played on a table, kind of like this. This is a uh, six by four table that I've uh, made recently. Um, but you do not need anything even remotely as fancy as this, and this isn't even um, that fancy. All you pretty much need is a kitchen table or a floor. You can play this anywhere you want to, but in this case, um, we are going to be playing on one of these tiles, which is two by two. So we're going to be playing on a very small board, but it's perfect for learning the rules. Dive into the actual battle and an actually an example game, I would just like to quickly go through um, a turn sequence. Now I have this gameplay summary, which is included in the Battle for Pelennor Fields box set, that actually details a turn sequence. A turn sequence, like it's one turn, it's both you and your opponent, take your actions, go through the phases, and that's one turn. A turn consists firstly of the priority phase. The priority phase is where you and your opponent will each roll a dice and whoever gets the highest roll has priority for the remainder of the turn. You then go into move phase, where you basically move your models. You go into the shoot phase, where you shoot with your models. You go into the fight phase, where you fight with your models. And then you're going into the end phase, which does not matter for these basic rules. So for our small example, um, tutorial-based game, we're just going to be having two small armies. We're going to be having an evil army consisting of these four Moran and Orcs, battling it out against the good army of these four warriors of Rohan, which is not painted, I know, um, but this is how they come in the box. And if you're brand new to miniature painting, um, this, is, this is what you get. Like, you get a plastic miniature that is not painted, and then usually what you want to do is go through and paint them up to get something like this and you can drop it on the floor and ruin it completely. But yes, these are going to be our two small armies. Um, normally, in a game of Middle Earth, you're going to be having heroes and warbands and a lot of miniatures. Um, well, not a lot, but at least more than this. But this is an example game. I just want to show you how the turn works. Um, and so I think this is best done with just a small fighting force. Um, so yeah, let's get to it. So this is after the models have been um, deployed. What uh, that basically means is that you just place down your miniatures. And here, over by the ruins, we have the Moran and Orcs, which are going to be facing off against the Warriors of Rohan in a defended position up on this hill. This is just going to be a fight to the death, and whoever is last standing wins. And we're just going to be playing on a single two feet by two feet board, marked out by these lines, and the floor and my feet. Okay, so the very first thing we have to do now that we have our forces on the table, we're ready to begin the game, you shake hands with your opponent, and you are ready to start. So, looking at the turn sequence, the first thing we have to do is the priority phase. What that means is that both players will roll off and see who goes first each turn, or each phase it should probably be. The player who scores the highest has priority. If the scores are tied, priority goes to the player who did not have it the previous turn. So, the blue dice are going to represent the good side, the red dice are going to represent the evil um, Moran and Orcs. So, what would happen is, if um, I'm playing the good side, I would roll my dice for priority. I'd get a four, or sorry, a five. My opponent playing the evil side would roll getting a 1. That means I have one priority for the remainder of this turn. And this is just something you have to 
keep in mind and remember. The next thing is we're going to go into the move phase. Now, before we are able to actually move our models, we need to know how many inches it can move. And in order to find that information, you have to look at a model's profile. The Warrior of Rohan is what we're going to be playing with as the good side. And there's a lot of different stuff. Well, you get a picture of the model, which is nice, and you can use it as a nice painting reference. You get some flavor text. Um, I recommend you skip everything except this box. Don't worry about war gear, don't worry about options, just ignore it. This box contains all the basic stat lines. The first is MV, which stands for move. This model has a six inch movement. The next one is the fight value. It has a three fight value in melee and a four up in ranged. It has three in strength, four in defense, one attack, one wound, which is basically how many um, li life or hit points it has, and three courage. Courage you can also ignore for the time being. So, six inches movement. Now, this information is obviously also available for the Moran and Orcs, which has a similar box. All models have such a box of their basic stat lines. And for the remainder of this game, we are going to be using this handy profiles at a glance, where we have the Warriors of Rohan right there, and we have the Moran and Orcs right there next to each other. In order to measure inches, get some sort of a measuring tape that measures in inches, not centimeters, because we use inches. Um, I have marked up six inches here, so since I want priority, that means I get to move first. In order to move a model, you simply have to say, well, I want to move a model. You don't even have to say it, you just do it. So if I want to move, um, let's say these two swordsmen here, I simply measure up and say, well, they can go six inches, which will bring them uh, just around to there. So I just place the tape measure next to the model. I move it up to the end of my six inches. I put them down. And that's it. That is simply how you move a model. You simply move it the movement distance. Now, you do not have to move six inches. You could move less. If I just wanted to move my warrior here, that's roughly three inches. He can just do that. I do also have two archers in my army. I have one here standing on a hill, ready to rain some hell down on these invading Moran and Orcs, and another covering the other flank right over here. Again, ready to rain down some hell. I decide not to move with these because a shooting unit, if you move the full movement distance of a shooting unit, you cannot shoot. If you move half or less, that means I could move up to three inches with my archers, but they would get a penalty when shooting. So you get the most accurate and best shooting if you leave them and do not move them. So I'm going to leave my archers where they are because they or in a pretty good position. Once I am done moving all my models, or deciding not to move any further models, I then pass on to my opponent. Again, just to clarify, you do not have to move all models, you just move the models you want to. I move two warriors and I left my two archers. I am then done with my movement phase and it is now my opponent's turn. Now, please keep in mind that I started moving because I won priority. If my opponent had won priority, he would get to move first before me. So now my opponent will move his Moran and Orcs. Now my invisible opponent has finished moving his Moran and Orcs and they have moved away from the ruins and are getting dangerously close to the warriors of Rohan. So that means the movement phase has now been completed. Both players have moved their models and we are now done with the movement phase. Now that both players have moved all their models, it is time to go into the shooting phase. So basically, that's just where you shoot with your models. And so if we have a look here on the board, we have two models that has a ranged weapon. We have one Rohan archer here on this cliff, and we have another one on this cliff. So both of these models will attempt to shoot with their bow. Now both of these bows has a 24 inch range. And as we can see, that is more than enough for both of them to hit whichever orc they want to. So, so.
So now that we know we have models with a ranged weapon and there are enemy models that they can shoot at, it is simply time to do it. Now in order to shoot at an enemy model, you simply say this guy wants to shoot at that guy. Now you have to pay special attention to anything in the way between these two models. Now in this particular circumstance, there is nothing between him and his target. So that is just a clean shot. In order to shoot with a bow, you need to look at the amount of attacks that your unit has. A rider of Rohan has one attack and the stats of a bow is actually found in the main rulebook. Now what you're interested in is the range and the damage of that particular weapon. Um, he has just a normal bow which has 24 inch range and a um, strength of 2. The strength of the model, oh sorry, there it is, the strength of the model you use in melee combat. When it is ranged combat you use the strength of the bow being fired. And so in order to um, proceed with a shooting attack you need to first hit and then you need to wound. So in order to hit your enemy you use the fight value with a plus sign. So in this case it's a 4 plus. The other one, the 3, is used in melee combat. So here it is pretty simple. It says on a 4 up you hit your target. So he shoots with his bow on this one and he needs a 4 up to hit him. And he does. He gets a 4. So that means the arrow has hit the orc. Now we need to figure out if the arrow actually damages the orc and it goes uh, through his armor or if it just kind of flinches off. And so in order to do that you use the to wound chart. Now I said the bow has a strength of 2 and again this is found in the main rulebook. So here and again it's a strength, a strength 2 and then you need to look at the defense of your target and our target was a Moran and Orc with a defense of 5. So a 2 against the defense 5 will actually mean I need a 6 to wound this Moran and Orc here. And that is because, as you can see, a Moran and Orc has a lot of armor on him. So it's going to take some, um, a bit of luck to get that arrow to kill him. So on a 6, and no, he does not get killed or wounded by the arrow. And that's basically a simple combat. Now, there are some extra cases um, which can complicate shooting, and that is basically if stuff is in the way. Here, let us say that these rocks were standing in front of this um, orc. So, if you draw a straight line between the shooter and the attacker, there is an intervening object, and that means it is not a clear shot. First of all, you need to make sure that the model can still see its target, and due to the higher ground, he can. If you couldn't see the target, obviously you can't shoot at it, but he can still see it. But there is a chance that while, when he shoots the arrow, that he will hit the rocks instead of his intended orc target. There is something called an in-the-way chart, which basically states what you need to roll in order to pass an in-the-way test. So. In this case, if I were to shoot at the orc here, I would need to take an in-the-way test for this piece of rubble. And you will basically look here and you will find the best match. A 3-up will be fences, bushes, crops and long grass. A 4-up is walls, rocks, tree trunks. So, here we can see that rocks is a perfect example because that is a rock. So that means that I would need a 4-up in order to actually hit my intended target. So what you would first do is roll your normal to hit on a 4 up for this guy. Then you would roll an in the way test to see if you hit the orc or the rock. If you roll a 4 or higher, it passes on to the orc and then you would roll to wound. If you score below the 4, you basically fail your in the way test and you hit the rocks instead. So that is just when you have to take in the way tests. Now, you can also take in the way tests if there are models between you and your intended target. Then there is a chance you might hit another model. And there are some extra rules here. For instance, 
a good army may not shoot at um, anyone if there are good models intervening because they don't want to risk hitting their own um, comrades. However, the evil side can do this. So if you had, let's just take this guy, we can remember where he was. If he was standing here, he was in the way of this shot and this guy would not risk taking a shot at this orc because he would be afraid to hit, hit, um, hit this guy. So this is an intervening model and good models will never shoot if they can risk hitting their own guys. But an evil model would. So if this guy was evil and there was another evil model here and then a good model here that he wants to shoot at, he can do it. He would need to take it in the way test for the model here. And if he failed it, he would actually hit his own model. But the good um, guys don't really care about that. So that's just a little caveat that can make shooting a little trickier. But when you have a clear shot, it is really straightforward. We have one more shooting left to do here, and that is this guy shooting at this guy. And again, if you draw a straight line, there is nothing intervening. So this is just a clear shot as well. So we take a dice, we need a four up to hit, and we hit him. And again, we need a six up to wound because the weapon's the same and the target uh, defense is the same. Nope. And again, so both were actually hit and the arrows just kind of struck off their armor. And this is actually it for shooting. So if we look at our turn summary here, we can see the next phase is the fight phase. Now the fight phase is the combat phase, but we do not have any models in combat. So that means we will just skip this phase and the turn is actually over. So this actually concludes the very first turn. We had Yun's move up, and we had two shooting attacks with just a straight shot to the target. So, since we didn't have any fight values, the turn is over. That means turn one is over. And I am going to be using the small handy turn markers um, that I got from the General's Accessory Pack. And I have a video of that if you are interested in seeing that. Um, so that basically means that turn one, um, the good side had priority. If the evil side had priority, I'll just flip it over to the evil side. It's just a way to keep track of what turn you're in and who's had priority in the different stages of the game. So going into turn two, you need to roll off for priority again. You just simply start the turn sequence all over and you start with the priority phase. So both players, the blue being the good guys, uh, Rohan, and the red is evil, roll off for priority. And good gets it again. So I will take my turn marker with the number two and place it on the good side, meaning that the good will start with priority again. Now, there is a special case here. In the case of a tie, um, the evil side would have gotten priority. So for instance, if this had been the role, evil side would get it because they did not have priority in the previous turn. If it is the very first turn and you get a tie, you simply re-roll it. Okay, so that's the priority phase done. It's a quick phase, but it's very important for the rest of the game. So now we go into the movement phase. Now good has priority, so they will move first. I decide to leave my archers standing where they are, simply because I want to be able to shoot um, and not get a penalty. So I decide not to move with the archers. Remember, I cannot move more than half the movement distance if I want to shoot. So since they have a six inch movement, I could move up to three inches, um, maybe to try and get away from that um, orc that's coming my way. But if I move at all, just if I move a single inch, I get a minus um, one penalty to the hit roll. So instead of hitting on a four up, I would hit on a five up. So I leave both archers standing where they are. And then I focus on the guys in the middle here. Now they can move six inches, and that is actually enough to bring them into close combat with these orcs here. And this is a great um, time to talk about a control zone. A control zone is basically an invisible one inch ring around a model. So you, you imagine a roughly one inch red ring around a model that is a control zone. That means an enemy model cannot go into a control zone unless they want to charge. So, taking my warrior here, I cannot move 
close to this orc here, because now I am inside his control zone. If I want to do this, I have to charge him. Now, you might think this is ridiculous, and you might think, well, what difference will that ever make? But the cool thing is, they can actually guard passages like this. So let's imagine that this orc was standing here, and I wanted to charge this guy here, well then I can't actually move past him because he is blocking the passage. I would first have to charge him, and in order to charge a model, you simply move the model into base contact, just like that. Once a model is engaged in combat, their control zone disappears, so that means in theory if there was enough room, I could now take a model and run past here. That is what the control zone um, does. Now this guy, he can move six inches, so he can actually reach him, whereas this guy, he can only reach the one over here. So this little dude here will move six inches into base contact with that orc there, and now he has effectively charged him. That is simply how you charge. Now this warrior will then do the same thing to that orc there. So now I have essentially charged two enemy models. And that is actually all my movement, the archers, I decide to leave stationary. Now the evil side will move their models. Now the evil side has completed their movement, and as we can see, the orcs are getting dangerously close to the archers. These guys cannot move. When you are engaged in combat, you cannot move. So they are simply locked in combat. So this here is also a great case on how um, priority can basically make sure that you get to the right targets. So here, since I went first, I could choose which units to lock down. In this case, it's not that exciting, but if there were certain hero characters that needed to get somewhere, I could make sure to hold them up, because you cannot move out of combat. So that is the movement phase complete. We'll now go into the shooting phase. This archer will shoot at that orc, again hitting on a 4-up, and he hits. Now wounding on a 6-up, no wound. Same thing over there, wounding on, oh sorry, hitting on a 4-up, he hits, and wounding on a 6, and nope. So lots of hits and no wounds, but it is very hard to wound a Morenon Orc with a simple bow. So now if we look at the turn sequence we're done with the shooting phase, now we go into the fight phase. Now, the player with priority will decide the order in which fights are resolved, because you take fights one at a time. Now, these fights are a simple one-off fights. You have one versus one and one versus one, so they are really straightforward. So, the order in which we do these doesn't matter, but it can matter. So, we simply start with this fight here. And in order to resolve a melee fight, you look at the profile of the warrior of Rohan, he has one attack, so I take one dice for him. The Morenon Orc has also one attack, so I take one dice for him. Now I make what is called a dual roll. And we can actually see it here, as detailed in the fight phase. Gather the number of dice you need for the dual roll, and use different color dice for each model with modifiers or might points available. That doesn't matter yet. So simply gather the number of dice you need, and I have one for each. Roll your dice. This is what is called the dual roll. So here, the red one scores the highest. Now, he actually won the fight. So after rolling dice, we apply modifiers. We don't have it. We use any rerolls. We don't have it. We use might. That's for heroes only, so we don't use it. The loser backs away. The evil side won, so the Morenon orc actually won. So that means the loser must back away one inch. And what that means is you simply have to move one inch roughly. You don't have to measure it. Just take it roughly one inch away from your enemy. The reason that you do this is, well, first of all, it gives you great clarity on which fights have been resolved. But also, if you are not able to move away, you will actually get trapped. So, for instance, say that um, I was locked in here and there was another enemy model standing here. I cannot back away here because this guy's control zone blocks me in, so I can't move this way because I will move through his control zone. I can't move back because I would be in a rock. 
and then you are trapped. When you are trapped, the enemy will make double strikes when rolling to wound you. So that is something very important. Trapping a model can prove very deadly. But in this case, there was no model trapped, so the loser simply backs away one inch. We have to roll to wound to see if the orc actually manages to kill him. In order to do that, we simply look at the profile for the Maran and Orc. He has a strength of four, and the warrior a defense of four. So we look, strength of four against defense of four is a four up. So on a four up, the warrior of Rohan is slain. And yes, rolls a five. So that means he has taken a wound. We then look at his profile, and he only has one wound. So that means he is just instantly slain and removed from the table. If he had multiple wounds, you would just place a dice next to, next to him and count how many wounds he has left. So that is essentially a combat, and that took out a warrior of Rohan. So moving on to the next combat, again I have one red and one blue dice for the dual roll. The good side wins this time, so the orc backs away one inch. I then look at the warrior of Rohan. Strength of 3 against a defense of 5, so strength uh, 3, defense 5, so he needs a 5 up to hit, and we can see the Moran and Orcs are really heavily armored. No, and he does not wound him, so that means they will simply be left like that. And now there are no more fights to resolve, no one is in base-to-base -base contact, so no fights are left to be resolved, and that is the end of turn 2. Also, the reason why you separate them and move away one inch is that now they are not within each other's control zones, so they are free to move on their particular turn. So again, we go back and we start with the priority phase. So rolling off to see who gets priority. And this time evil gets it. So turn three goes to the evil guys in priority. Now, so this means that evil may move first. And this is a great time to have priority because the archers, if Rohan had, had priority, they could have moved away, making sure that the orc couldn't reach them. But in this case, they can't because they will move first. So he will charge this guy. And over here on the left flank, he will charge this guy. And then in here, these two orcs will actually charge this poor little warrior. So then we go into the shooting phase. You cannot shoot if you're engaged in combat, and both archers are right now engaged in the combat, so they cannot shoot their bows. We then go straightly into the fight phase, and the evil side will, in this case, determine in which order to resolve the fights. But again, it doesn't matter, so we're just going to take them one at a time. Usually, you would save the most exciting fight till the end, and this one I find more exciting, because it's, it's two against one, so it's a little more exciting. So we're just going to take this combat here, and when you have a bow, it's simply the same as if you had a sword now when you're in melee combat. So you just use the strength of the model, um, again, when resolving the wounds. So rolling for the dual roll, and the evil side gets it. So he moves it back one inch, and on a four up, he is dead, he is not. Onto the other side here, dual roll, whoops, and this is a tie. Now when you get a tie in a dual roll, you look at the fight value. Now for the warrior of Rohan, he has a fight of a 3 and a 4 up. Now remember that this 4 plus, the last number, is the ranged fight value. So that this warrior needs a 4 up to hit with a ranged weapon. Now, the number before that, the 3, the first number, is the melee fight value. Whenever you get a tie, the winner will be the model with the highest fight value. In this case, the warrior and the Moran and Orc both has a fight value of 3. So that means we have to roll off to see who actually wins. But if the warrior had had a um, fight value of a 4 and the Moran and Orc a 3, the warrior would have run the dual roll. So, what you do is you take a dice and you roll. On a 1 to 3, the evil side wins. On a 4 to 6, the good side wins. So that's a 6, so that means the warrior of Rohan has actually won this combat, and this guy will back away 1 inch. Now, let's see if we can kill an orc on a 5 up. And we do. This Moranan orc has been slain by that warrior of Rohan. 
Now we go into the last fight here. We still have one warrior for Rohan, so he gets one dice. But now we have two Moran and Orcs, so they get one dice each when rolling in the dual roll. So as we can see now, there is a much higher chance of the evil side winning this roll off. So the good guy will roll first, he only gets a two, and then the evil side rolls, and then they will use the highest number rolls. They don't combine it to a five, they simply use the highest one, which in this case was a three, and the other one was a two. So by getting that three, that extra attack, this managed to secure the victory for them. So this guy backs away an inch from both of them. And then when they roll to wound, they will use both dice because they each make a strike to try and kill him. So on a four up, and where we get a six. So he has been slain. So not looking too good for Rohan. Here at the end of turn three, um, getting a lucky arrow in could turn the tide of battle, but we'll see. So again, we go into priority phase, so we roll off, and we get a cock dice for the evil. Oh, and evil gets it. So turn four is also going to the evil side. So the evil side will move first. This guy here will simply charge the archer again, and these guys will move up. So now the evil has completed their movement, and we have one fight down here, so this archer is locked in combat. But in the shooting phase, which we are going into now, he can actually shoot. So he will try and shoot at this orc right here. So, hitting on a four, and he does not hit. That's it for the shooting phase. Then we go into the combat phase. One against one. Evil side takes it. Rohan backs away an inch, and on a four up, he is slain. And he is not, he survives. And that is actually the end of turn four. So rolling for priority and evil actually gets it again. So we can see evil has got some pretty good priority rolls there. And this means that he will charge in again here. And the orcs down here are now able to charge the warrior on top here. So now the orcs have moved into position. So we have a two on one fight here and a one-on-one -on -one down here. So, starting with the one-on-one, -on -one, one dice for each, and evil side gets it. He backs away, and on a four-up he is dead, and he lives again. So this is one sturdy warrior. And then on the other side here, we have two red dice and one blue. And there the evil actually, oh sorry, the good guy actually gets it. So he wins this roll-off. So he wins the duel, and they will back away an inch. Now we are fighting on top of a cliff here, so that can complicate things a bit, but we are not worrying about terrain rules um, yet. So now I have to decide which one to strike. It doesn't really matter in this case, so I'm just gonna strike that guy down here because I only have one dice. So I decide to try and use it on him. So on a five up, and no, he survives. And that is the end of turn five. Rolling for priority, and evil gets it once more. <clears throat> and this is just simply moving the models back into the charge there and then we go straight into combat again so down here one for each and the good guy wins this time so maybe he is finally able to slay his opponent and he is not and up there two for the orcs one for the warrior and the warrior wins again. Incredible. On a five up, he slays one. And he actually does. An orc has been slain. I should have actually said which one I was um, targeting, but it didn't really make um, any difference here. So at the end of turn six here, we are actually left with a pretty close combat. One guy remaining on each side. So rolling for priority. Good guy gets it. Now, I can't do much else than to simply charge in because if I move six inches away, he can't catch me, but I still can't shoot at him. So it makes little sense to try and um, run away. 
and he goes in right there. So we start with this combat down here. And the good warrior wins. And on a five up, he kills him. And he doesn't. And on the other hill here. The orc wins that dual roll. And on a four up. And nothing. And that is the end of combat. Now, when we are down to this few models, there is not much else to do than simply just keep alternating between priority, charging in, and fighting until someone wins. You will rarely get into this because you would <clears throat> often you will play scenarios with missions, but when you play to the death, this is usually what it can come down to. So we're rolling for priority again. And the good guy gets it. So he gets to charge in here, he gets to charge in there. And then we go to combat, this combat here. The warrior wins it. And on a five up. Ooh, and he slays him. Boom, now the tables have turned. The other combat here, there's only one orc remaining. And this might be the end of the game on a five up. No, the orc survives. So we have one orc and two warriors remaining. So rolling for priority. Evil side gets it and he charges in. And this warrior will move roughly six inches to try and get down to help his buddy. He cannot shoot into combat, so even if I decided not to move him, he can't shoot into combat because he is a good model and he will not risk hurting his own guy. An evil model could actually do this because, again, he wouldn't mind hurting his own guy. So when you're shooting into combat, you simply take an in-the-way test for the model they are fighting. But again, good models will not do it. So rolling for this fight down here. And the orc actually gets it on a four up. No, nope, nothing. So he is safe. Rolling for priority on the next turn. And the good side gets it. So he charges in. And he moves roughly six inches up. You would have to measure the distance, but I'm now just kind of taking it as we go, because this is a practice game. So taking this combat here, one on one. The good guy wins. And on a five up, nope. Rolling for priority again. And the evil side gets it. So he will charge in here. And then the good guy will charge in here on his movement phase. Now we get two blue dice against one red. Because we now have two warriors against one orc. The good guys get it. And the orc will back away this way. So two dice on five up. And no, they do not get it. Only for priority on a new turn. The evil gets it, but again, we will just be back in the same uh, combat. So, two blue, one red. The orc actually wins. So now he has a chance to even the score on a four up. And he does. So, one of them has been slain. This is actually a really exciting fight. Now we are left back down to these two models. So, we don't really have to roll for priority now because they will simply be in combat. So we will just resolve the combat until someone is the winner. So rolling a dual roll. And the good guy gets it. He backs away. And I roll on a five up. He wins. And he gets a golden six. Killing that orc and leaving a single warrior of Rohan victorious. Wow, so actually super interesting battle, even if you just had four miniatures on each side. It, it felt really balanced, the power shifting back and forth, and eventually leaving Rohan victorious. So yeah, that is how you play the game, in a very, very simple format, using only infantry model, not counting special rules. But this is a great way to play a few games, just basic infantry, use the basic stat lines, uh, and not worry too much about all the special rules, just to get the feel of the game. In later videos, we're going to include um, more advanced rules and we're going to introduce heroes, which makes the game a whole lot more interesting. So, thanks a lot for watching and I hope to see you next time.